Former Pope Benedict XVI passed away on New Year's Eve at the age of 95. Born in Germany as Joseph Ratzinger, Benedict was head of the Catholic Church between April 2005 and February 2013 when he resigned to be replaced by Pope Francis. Benedict then chose to be known as Pope Emeritus until his death. Joining me now to discuss the legacy of this hugely significant figure, I'm delighted to welcome the historian and journalist David Oldroyd Bolt. Thank you for joining us, David. Good evening, Andrew. Thank you. Could you perhaps give us some uh, understanding of his background, Benedict's background, because, you know, he was a very academic individual, wasn't he? Well, that's the first and most important thing to understand about Pope Benedict, about Joseph Ratzinger as he was, was that he was really an academic. He was a philosopher. He was a full professor at the age of only 31, which is incredibly young by academic standards. He began his career at the University of Bonn. Uh, he then uh, moved on, and in 1968... Uh, uh, at Tübingen uh, was when he really started to move from being what was considered on the liberal side of, of the church uh, or into being seen as more of a conservative. Yes. Because this is the time in 1968 when all around Europe there was student ferment, there was a famous événement in Paris where the students ripped up the cobblestones outside the Sorbonne. Uh, all across Europe and America, in fact, there were student protests. There was the Democratic National Convention of 68 where students in support of RFK uh, rioted, essentially. So this was a time at which uh, Pope, France, uh, Pope uh, Benedict started to think of himself as uh, changing in his churchmanship, in his approach to the church, uh, and then uh, this solidified later on uh, in his academic appointments. But I think it is important to note that he always considers himself really to be uh, not a modernist, but on the more liberal side. He was certainly no ossified traditionalist. And indeed, that will surprise people. Well, indeed, dur that. during the uh, process of Vatican II, the Second Vatican Council, uh, he was one of the advisers who was in favour of some of the more liberalising aspects. Now, of course, when he was Pope later on, he uh, reiterated that that did not mean that traditional practices could not be engaged in, such as the, the uh, celebration of the old rite of the Latin Mass. Uh, it's important to note that, uh, much against popular uh, view, it was still, after Vatican II, perfectly permissible to celebrate the Mass in Latin. It's just yes. a lot of people decided not to. There was a, what's called, called a Novus Ordo, a new order of service, which was in Latin. But the difference was that after, 19, after the Second Vatican Council, after the 1960s, there was more participation by the congregation, whereas the old rite, which under Samoran Pontificum of 2007, was once again permitted to be used, there was more of a focus on uh, collective prayer, yes. with the priest standing facing ad orientum uh, to the east of the altar and all of the congregation facing with him. Uh, there, it is always him in the Catholic Church. Uh, and uh, just this idea that there was less sort of audience participation. People forget how sort of radical R Vatican II was in many ways, but it's yeah. interesting to hear you talk about a liberal side of the church versus a conservative side mm. of the church and Benedict's sort of journey along those lines. A lot of people will be surprised by that because, of course, surely isn't the appeal of the Catholic Church, it's traditionalism, the fact that it, it will always be conservative. Well, it's one of those things uh, from the great Catholic novel Bryce had revisited where Charles Ryder, the main character, says, I thought the thing about Catholics uh, was everybody says they're supposed to know what they believe. Well, the thing is that, uh, yes, Catholics do know what they believe in the broadest, most general sense, but in any congregation of two billion believers, uh, in an NA hierarchy with thousands and thousands and thousands of priests, bishops, cardinals, and then the Pope at the top, you're going to have a variance of view. Of course. And I think it's an important thing to, to note that in the Catholic Church, there, there is and always has been, right from the foundation of the Church, really in the second century AD. There has always been debate about the nature of Christ. There has always been debate about the nature of the service, about the role of women. It's just that that debate uh, can be seen with an historical perspective uh, to, war uh, to warp and wane, uh, and therefore it can seem that there is over 2,000 years only one direction of travel. Yeah, there's a, an impression of the Catholic Church that, you know, you've got the catechism and those are the rules and you go there and yeah. look at that and that's it. Actually, there are always uh, debates flourishing there in the Church. There always are, and there always should be. Otherwise, uh, you need intellectual vitality mm. in order to in ensure that the Church does not ossify and become a total irrelevance. That is not to say, however, and this is where Benedict would be seen as conservative, that the Church should change itself for the to be relevant. Unlike, say, the Anglican Church, which seems to have a preoccupation with this nowadays, Yes. Uh, Benedict's whole idea was that the church is, is a rock uh, and that uh, people cleave to it in times of unsteadiness. And while you get other churches, such as the Anglican Church, but also even sort of the Baptist Church in America, so, it's sort of tagging on to these very sort of new ideologies about identity politics, mm. uh, it, it does feel like the Catholic Church, for, for however progressive Francis is, relatively speaking, will be immune to those kind of developments. Do you think that's right? I don't think it is as fair to say he's immune. And I would uh, state that, yes, or I would uh, aver that Pope Francis is, in this respect, uh, more traditional than many of his critics would give him mm. credit for. Yeah. Uh, there has been talk in the German church particularly about the possibility of divorcees being able to remarry and take communion and possibly even that married men 
uh, might become priests, um, the, or rather that priests might be able to marry. Married men can become priests through the ordinariate. But I think the point to avert here is that the Catholic Church is much less likely than other churches, like the Episcopalian Church, yes. like the Anglican Church, uh, to go along with that, simply because of the size of it. There are two billion Catholics, and, and there, though it is an, uh, a totally hierarchical organization, there is a great, uh, I suppose, respect for mm. debate and respect also for the validity of tradition, unless it's changed at something like a, a, a Vatican Council, of which there have only been two, of course. Uh, that's not to say there haven't been other ecumenical councils. Uh, but I think that Benedict was particularly interesting in this regard because he saw the great crime as relativism. He didn't think of uh, p politics so much as he did against uh, I relativism versus an idea of truth. Mm. Uh, and indeed, he, in one of his uh, most famous quotes, he said that the problem with relativism is essentially that it... Uh, translates or uh, brings relative ideas and objective opinions to the status of truth, and in that you get totalitarianism. So this was his great preoccupation. Uh, and I think he looked at the world around him after the 1968 event and, and going into the 90s and 2000s when he was congregation, head of the Congregation for the Doctrine of Faith and then Pope, and thought that this is something that he as Pope could really do. Yes. He could stop this idea that everything was up for grabs, that everything was totally and utterly irrelevant uh, in, a, in the sense of truth, and that it only mattered what you believed, and that there were, in fact, universal truths. And he always brought this back to the figure of Jesus Christ, uh, that the belief in Jesus Christ was the central rock upon which Christianity was built, or the, rather the belief in Christ, divinity, and resurrection, and that cleaving to those eternal truths is what brought us together as, as a species. And do you think that will be partly his legacy? Because at the moment it feels to me that that emphasis on relativism is more important than ever, just because truth... Well, there are multiple truths now, well, multiple yes. ways of knowing. That's very fashionable, but if the Catholic... Church can cleave to that idea, uh, to, to Benedict's idea of relativism, then maybe things can improve. Well, I think it's, it's one of the things that, as a Catholic, you can actually take some, um, some comfort in, despite the fact that there are parts of the Church that would uh, dispute this, and there are, I don't know, it's too short a time to go into this, but it's not to say that the whole Catholic Church believes absolutely in, in the idea uh, of, of absolutism mm. um, versus relativism, but I think overall it does. And I think the thing that Benedict's legacy will be for all of us is that he showed the, uh, the philosophical and intellectual validity of this point of view. When the whole of the uh, intellectual establishment, really, around the Western world was, from the 60s, 60s onwards, saying, well, actually, there is no such thing as a truth. There is no such thing as, you know, real objective. Objectivism. There is only this relative idea that depends on circumstances and context. I think the fact that this man was for the best part of 50 years there and respected as an intellectual, as a philosopher and then as a pope and averring this constantly will be the greatest legacy that he leaves to us. David Aldrop-Bolt, thank you very much for joining me today. Thank you.